The concept of fate upsets me. Any sense or variation of the word. Destiny, inevitability, being doomed, ill-fated, or even being blessed or a chosen one. Even death itself, especially when personified, takes the form of a villainous but unavoidable fate. I value and find comfort in the idea of free will, the complete freedom of choice and the idea of an endless amount of possibilities and realities that could branch off from every decision made. Not even just binary, yes or no, good and bad. There are so many in-betweens and marriages of both sides. The idea that everything we do, have done, and will do being already decided is almost insulting to me, as it takes away our own agency, and in many ways our own blame. Can it be a comfort to explain away a bad event by blaming fate and the idea that it was bound to happen? Of course, but I think that reality is much more complex than that. If we do live in a world where fate is a real measured concept, I want to resist it however I can. Shake the bars of the cell, deny it, even if I'm proven wrong and foolish. Even if my resistance is pre-planned within it, I want to be standing in the face of it and say no. Become a flower blooming even when starved of sunlight, even if I will be wilted by its inevitability. I think of the movie The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, where our hero Antonius Block tries to avoid or at least stall his own fate by challenging death to a chess game, knowing he will most likely lose. Yet still he attempts. He struggles against his fate with his wits and confidence about him, calmly cheating and challenging something as unconquerable as death itself. I think most of us mere mortals can identify with that. Despite its inevitability, he still tries. I do want to clarify, if you find comfort in fate and it works for you, I'm not calling you bad or stupid. I think that's perfectly a valid way to feel, and there is no objective way to prove one side or the other is correct. In fact, I think there is an enlightenment and tranquility to be had for those who accept the idea of fate. And once, I myself did believe in something like fate. But for me, it was a negative. Something to accept bad times and circumstances. To say it cannot be fixed. A crutch. A prison cell. Others, I'm sure, can view it in a healthier and more comforting way. I just can't. It is impossible for me. Or at least the me of right now. All this to say, the topic of this video is a character who I feel represents my feelings on fate fairly well. And similar to Antonius in the Seventh Seal, she just tries to try, damn it. Even if she'll most likely fail again and again. A character who, within her own world and existence, is truly fated to lose time and time again, with no possibility of it ever ending or her ever winning. She is lost and died for a streak of hundreds, possibly thousands of times. And although she always fails, she still continues on. And perhaps she too can finally deny fate, and for once, win. Or at the very least, survive. This video is about the video game Kingdoms of Amalur in the character within it, known as the Maid of Windermere. Kingdoms of Amalur is, at its core, a game about fate. The player character, the fateless one, is, <laughs> get this, fateless. But even their fatelessness, their death and rebirth, is ordained and predicted by fate weaver and deity alike. Past that event, they are free. Many others in this world have also finally become free. If it was a machine, fate had just had a metric ton of wrenches thrown to its cogs. It begins to break down immediately, stopping many preordained things. But the ones it affects most of all are the Fae. In the world of Amalur, Fae are a species of people who exist as representations of nature and fate joined as one. And arguably, fate up until now was just nature to this setting, a law as clear as all others. Fae never truly die and are often reborn to fill the same role over and over again. In the case they don't want to fulfill that role, or the telling of the world needs it filled immediately, another fey naturally fills their place, a ship of Theseus. Though the original fey is gone, a fey that's identical to that one in role takes their place, and perfectly recreates their purpose. And as such, are they a different person? Or is it the same person? Events replay on a loop. Fairy tales are real, and they are happening over and over again for eternity, like Shakespeare on the stage. But rather than actors choosing to play their roles, they are ordained to fill those roles. There will always be a Hamlet, always be an Ophelia, a Horatio. The play will always happen because they perpetuate it. Fate is a real, tangible, measurable law of this world, until it isn't. Amalur has a deeply interesting world that on its surface looks like the most generic fantasy ever. And in some ways it is, but the more esoteric side of it is genuinely fascinating. 
As I've already mentioned, fate being a tangible law of the world means that the average person's life is very different to the average person of, say, Lord of the Rings or Elder Scrolls. A farmer could have his marriage, kids, divorce, and death told to him by a random drunk fate weaver with a deck of cards traveling through his village, and have each and every event happen perfectly, with no way to change it. Because of this, to borrow a quote from Warlockracy's Enderall video, the problems of the people within the world of Amalur are very different from the problems of those in the real world, or even other fantasy worlds. Even more so now that fate has been broken. I won't lie to you. Some of Amalur's side quests and even main quests are not the best. There is so much useless and repetitive content, and I would honestly trade dozens of random open world quests and dungeons for just five or ten more fully fleshed out quests sprinkled throughout the factions. Quality over quantity is something I do believe in. Though within quantity, there can often be found shining gems, one of which is the House of Ballads questline. The House of Ballads is joinable very early into the game. It's also relatively short, it's probably my favorite faction in the whole game. The House of Ballads is run by a court of Fae. These Fae exist solely to forever reenact the famous stories of their people through their court of enchantments. These stories are similar to the Celtic Legendarium of our world. The Knights of the House of Ballads feels very Arthurian and the tales themselves are straight from a fairy tale anthology. For an example, and fittingly enough, the first House of Ballads tale, we, the player, interact with, is the Song of Sir Sagril. It is a popular tale, featuring the summer court's most treasured rogue. One afternoon, Sagril, his head sleepy with wine and dreams of women, awoke to a terrible roar. The treacherous maid of Windermere, villain of the House of Ballads, was summoning forth a beast from beneath the earth. She wished to send it against Swenson himself. When the maid departed, Sagril tread into the beast's lure and killed it, only to realize that it was simply the first of many deadlier enemies. What a song. It is a very standard fairy tale affair. I do find it interesting that it never cares to mention why the maid is doing what she is, just that she's the villain. I suppose it's just simply accepted. The wolf of Red Riding Hood is just a villain, you don't need to know why, he just is. And the maid is presented very similarly. We encounter this after our first visit to the House of Ballads, and find that unexpectedly fate has been subverted. Events that the Fae themselves even referred to being scripted are suddenly burned off the page. Sir Sagril always slays the Thresh, but he's failed, died, and as such the house are holding auditions oh. for the next Sir Sagril. Do you, do any of you, have the courage to pass the confirmation? If you do, your adventures will be sung to the heavens for all eternity. We meet Hallam the White, the famous head of the House of Ballads, a storyteller at heart and as ancient as the house itself. The audition for this open position to send many volunteers to the legendary dungeon of this song, and whichever one happens to survive and recover Sagril's ring, gets to become the new Sagril. You can volunteer. Everyone scoffs at the concept of a mortal trying to strive for Fae's greatness, but they'll still happily let you attempt, laughing and expecting your death, claiming that a mortal can never understand something so great as the House of Ballads and its telling. Thanks. This is no childish contest, mortal. This is a battle for a lasting glory. When we arrive, we meet the others who have joined. They seem upset that a mortal has been allowed to attempt, but ultimately they accept us. We learn that this isn't the first strange thing to happen in this telling, as a mysterious woman approached each and every single one of them, asking them to become her spy within the house. They all refused. We're also told that some here have auditioned several times before for other roles, which I find interesting. The Fae who take on the role of the knights must go in and out of roles fairly often. And in fact, later on in the questline, we meet someone who retired from a knight's role. Either way, we and the others split up to open the way to the Thresh. This, this song has been done so many times, and this Thresh killed and the path opened in the exact same way that they have made literal switches to kill part of this great tree to get into it. I'm sure the first time this happened, those didn't exist. The original Sagro had to cut his own way through, alone. Either way, the other applicants die in this attempt. 
leaving only us and the Fae who teamed up with us. When we flip all the switches and venture below to kill the Grave Thresh, our companion speaks about how everything feels wrong. We continue forward to fetch the ring from Sir Sackrell's body, and when we do, secret paths open on either side, and two other Threshes, as well as a host of Boggarts, arrive, killing our final companion. And as such, we, the mortal, emerge victorious, the sole survivor. Arriving back, we're congratulated quickly and told that we're needed for another tale already. Little ceremony is held. It's more like getting an internship or an office job. Either way, we are told the next tale. The Tale of Bloody Bones. Sir Ferrara tracks the villain Bloody Bones to his lair and rescues the fair maiden, sacrificing himself in the process. This is Ferrara's most selfless act, to give up his own glory for the good of another. It has always been this way, and must be preserved for all seasons. We're given a potion of resurrection and are told that we must meet the king of the House of Ballads, Winston, who in actuality is the fifth person to hold that title. He holds little actual sway over the Fae. He is king and title alone, purely ceremonial. Maybe the original Winston had power and land, but this current one exists solely to sit in the chair and do the stories he's involved with when the time comes. With him are two other members of the Court of Enchantments, Lady Olin and the Queen Bellmaid. They talk at length of how brilliant he is and how perfect a fae and king. He is so perfect. The most important in all the great songs. I mean, look upon his majesty. He seems absolutely in love with his role as a king, telling us, Oh, we don't have to kneel. Of course, he wouldn't even have the title if he could. Please, just call me a Winston. Tells us the quest of Sir Ferrari, or sorry, Ferrara. After saving a kidnapped maiden, he is destined to die, and us, Sagril, are to revive him after killing Bloody Bones, riding off into the sunset. When we arrive, Ferrari seems to think it's a joke that a mortal's been assigned to the role, but nonetheless, we continue on with this sex god. My skills with the blade, and in the bed, know no equal. He comes across so disingenuine, especially when he isn't even the original Ferrara to earn these accolades. It's like he's an actor trying to claim the exploits and accomplishments of their character. Ferrara seems to treat his upcoming death like necessary but annoying paperwork. Seems like the Fae would argue that he is stoic and brave for this. But I would say very easily that he's not. If you're told by fate you will survive and have done so so many times, always acting out the story identically, there is no bravery to be had doing that. It's simply a formality. An acting job. Sean Bean, the actor, isn't brave for dying on screen. He'll stand back up at the end of it. No hate to you, Sean. Love you, man. I like these fucking horrible fae. Either way, the telling of the story here is corrupted as well. Rather than one woman kidnapped, Bloody Bones has taken an entire camp of people, from adults to children. We fight through the dungeon, freeing the people, and finally come upon Bloody Bones with his last holding of hostages. He seems normal, at least as far as Fae go, and he speaks of his own imprisonment in the cycle. For one mistake he made millennia ago, he's fated to forever be alone. Isolated and disdained, his greatest fear in his original life forced upon him for eternity. To be hated and alone. Constance, it is not a life. It is not a death. It is a snare in which I have struggled for centuries. No more. That's true. My intent was never to do harm. All I want, all I have ever wanted was love. Not to be alone in my eternal grief. Fine. The prisoners are free to go. It's like the concept of a torturous hell taken very literally. He cannot redeem himself, apologize, move on, or pay penance for a prison sentence. They never allow him that. He's immortal, and all of their fae are given a chance to continue on. But he has to be a good little meat puppet and die like he's supposed to, forever being alone, sad, and angry, only to die over and over for a sin he committed so long ago he probably doesn't even remember it. Speaking to him, we call his bluff that he would harm innocents. And interestingly enough, he agrees. He sets them free, but still, he attempts to fight against his captors and free himself from this torturous existence. He kidnaps people just to summon us here, like all the other times. 
He kills Ferrari in the process, like fate ordains, but we vanquish Bloody Bones and resurrect Ferrara. At this point, already turned off by the face treatment of mortals, I began to like them less and less. I think it's very clear that these villains are only still villains because they're fulfilling their roles, and they're forced to fulfill them by fate and by these fae. If they could, I think they would easily choose to talk it out and leave, atone for their sins. I mean, they already have atoned for them in this eternal hell, but the Fae would never allow it. They have to do their ever so important mission of showing themselves and all of their Fae how great they are by reliving the same great stories and feats that they have over and over again. This is literally the only reason that they ever give. They must keep the stories alive and show each other how great they are lest it be forgotten. That's just the worst thing, according to them, to be forgotten. Even if Bloody Bones tried to speak, I know that they would just kill him. Insist that he fulfill his role and have someone else save the day. It has to be the same. Reruns of the same story over and over again. The same seasons and episodes replayed on repeat. No new great deeds to do or to see. Only the same. And we have to do them. It's twisted. Absolutely evil in my opinion. For a species meant to be immortal and wise and above everyone else, they come across immensely childish. No, this is the way it is. It always has been this way and it always will be. We're so great and we have to keep showing you how great we are. Look what we did 10,000 years ago. We just did it again. It honestly feels like a caricature and call out of older generations latching onto their ideals and beliefs, refusing any change at all in the concepts that they fully believe in, not allowing any outsider's point of view or even trying to humanize what they believe is bad. Returning, we're told of another quest. This one not a part of the telling. It's off the books. We gotta go to a library and seek a record. Most important records the Fae have. And a new invention made because Hallam the White foresaw the Fateless One's coming. And how it would destroy magic and fate as a whole. These Fae cairns are essentially ways of immediately listening to and reliving a tale. Things like this already existed, as lore stones. But those have been corrupted by those horrible, horrible mortals who dare make their own. So, the Fae have made their own audiobook service, of course. Only they are allowed to listen to. And we're told to fetch one of these Fae cairns. A tale known as the Hero and the Maid. It's worth noting, Hallam the White, premier storyteller of the House of Ballads, has gone away to do important business, and as such, he's not at home right now. This is called Foreshad- When we arrive at the library, we find its keeper, Tinwa, trapped in a magical barrier. We learn that the maiden Nyx, an enchanted troll, came to the library, stole the Fae Cairns, and trapped Tinwa in this magical prison. Two knights of legend, Sir Aramir and Kreth, who are known to valiantly, quote-unquote, slay the troll, arrived a little before we do, and are now going after the troll. We go to assist them, but first we ask her some questions. We learned that she was once a knight of the House of Ballads, but now has a calling as a librarian. Further, we ask her about the original legend. What is Nyx's great villainy? It is a tale of what happens when one wishes to become something he has not. In this case, the subject of the song was Nyx the Troll, a loathsome, pitiful brute. As a jest, the Maid of Windermere enchanted Nyx into believing he was an ordinary man. He attempted to settle in a quaint mortal village to predictable disaster. When the knights Kreth and Aramur arrived, they treated him like the man he longed to be. They challenged Nyx to a gentlemanly duel and slew him in fair combat. Oh. Uh. He wanted to be accepted among humans. When he was told he was turned into a human, he happily went to a human settlement to settle there. The humans were scared, and he accidentally destroyed some buildings. So, our two knights arrive, and, according to the librarian's word, treated the troll honorably, as they would a man. Which is challenging him to a gentlemanly duel, and slaying him two on one. Oh yes, how heroic. Killing a sentient creature who just wanted to be accepted, and sure, was dangerous, but hadn't seemed to kill anyone, and just wanted to live somewhere. How brilliantly honorable. How absolutely nice of them. I I do like, from like, 
a lore perspective, how these fairy tales don't have happy endings for anyone but the Fae. It's horrible deeds done so long ago and the hype that it'd be amazing. I feel most of us horrible humans would want a witchery-style conclusion to this, the troll reasoned with and set back into the wilds, or a natural transformation for him, or convincing the humans to let him stay in the settlement. I mean, we learn in an earlier quest in the game that the Fae can change people. They change a wolf into a human. Why couldn't they change a troll into a human? Things called <laughs> pants. How do you tolerate them? But nope. These brave knights murder a happy troll who dared question his station in life. How dare he try and change whenever his path was already chosen for him. The librarian can also name drop the maid of Windermere's real name, Magwear. It seems the title they gave her is easier, though. Dehumanizes her. Just like Bloody Bones, who also has a real name, Faymor. We go after these two brilliant gentlemen, who somehow missed picking up a fake hair in like 15 feet from the cave they entered, but whatever. To be fair, there is a troll by it. So maybe they couldn't honorably challenge it to a 2v1, I don't know. We find them sitting calmly in the entrance. They seem wary about us, the new mortal Sagril, and annoyed that Nyx has broken his part. They laugh and treat Nyx like an old friend who they've slayed countless times. It is honestly disgusting to me. It comes across very sadistic. We learn that this Sir Kreth is only the second to bear the name, meaning he may have known the original Kreth as well as many of the original knights. Going through the dungeon, picking up more cairns, we catch up to Nyx. It seems Sir Aramir and Kreth aren't too concerned with keeping tradition, however. No gentlemanly duel is called, nor treating Nyx as a human. They are more than happy to 3v1 Nyx with you and murder him. Again, denying him a chance of decency. They shrug and head back to the House of Ballads. Now that we have all the cairns that are here, we return to the library. There we listen to the full version of the story through the cairns and try and find the words to dispel the trapped librarian. After failing once and getting cursed, we succeed, and she is set free. She talks of Nyx with a petty hatred. They treated him like the man he longed. It is good you killed him. He deserved it for working with the likes of the maid. Of course he will be back, so don't get too self-congratulatory. Before, when I spoke to her, she pretended to feel sorry for Nyx. And in the song itself, whenever you listen to it, it speaks about Nyx in pity. After the fight, they kindly reprimand Nyx with the message of, Just stay who you are. There is nothing wrong with that. Yet here this librarian is who was a previous knight, changing her station to be a librarian. Yet, Nyx can't change theirs. She's happy that Nyx and all the other servants of the maid are dead, reveling in Nyx's death for daring to try and be something that he isn't. We return to find that, of course, the entire damn core of enchantments has been captured. The maid speaks to us in a force projection for a moment, you may search the Empire ten times over, but you will not find your beloved Wenson, nor his foolish court of enchantments. They, like you, are mine. Dream of me, lovely, for we shall be together soon. The time is coming. And then we speak to Hallam, who is away. He tells us the story of the maid, and how she is heroically killed by King Wenson who seduces her, using her love for him against her, and literally stabbing her in the back. I feel like a broken record at this point, but these face suck. He tells us to find a human priest, Father Ater, who he is friends with, to learn more about the maid's new magic, and how she can possibly be changing so much and has become so powerful. We go to the monastery to find the father is murdered. Boating around, we find an empty case labeled for crystals and several scattered journals throughout Reading them, we learned that the monastery's well had run dry. As they excavated deeper, they found a large cave system. Inside of it, special crystals. Their property seeming to deny all magical laws around it. In addition, just before the father's death and our arrival, the maid appeared, introducing herself and asking about them. When she received no answers, she left. The father threw them down the well afterwards, scattering them. Brother Wolf, Enchanted by the crystals, a hypnotic song bouncing off of them, fell for their snare of power, and murdered Father Atair in a rage, 
and went to search for the scattered crystals. Learning this, we enter the well too, exploring and finding many of the crystals among kobolds, who we have to slay. We find a wolf, wounded and still cursed by the crystals. We can Gandalf Theoden him, though. The curse is broken. If we have a high enough dispel skill. He's remorseful and gives us a whistle that can let us discover the crystals. The sound from it bouncing off of them like the song that he can hear. We blow it and find the crystal, leaving the cave and returning to the House of Ballads once more. As we arrive, the maid appears again, acting villainously, saying she always gets what she wants, implying that the crystals and wolf were her doing. The white and his pet to expose my plans. You will regret ever joining the House of Ballads. You will have to try better than that, beloved. I keep secrets for a reason. I wanted the mission's crystals, but the marshal and his boy would not cooperate. But I always find a way to get what I desire, don't we all? I am known as the Maid of Windermere, but that is all you shall learn this day. Winston is with me, and he will stay with me until I deem it fit to return him. If the House of Ballads wishes to have its king, it must send its greatest warrior. Since I have all of them, that leaves you. Come, I wish to collect you as well. I will be waiting. And that she wishes to collect us, calling us her beloved. We speak to Hallam and learn that we have one more tale to do. The champion. Where the last champion of the House of Ballads, Sir Elswin, goes to the maid, beating all her defenses only to fall under her spell and become her greatest champion. We must break this, he says. It is our duty to all that has come before. Again, this reverence of the past needs to constantly repeat, though us breaking this song would be denying tradition, though for the House of Ballads' benefit. He gives us another resurrection potion and sends us on our way to Windermere with his best wishes. Windermere located just northeast of the House of Ballads. I would like to say real quick, I don't like the inclusion of resurrection potions as a plot point. I think it kind of takes away a lot of agency in the plot and worries of death. It makes things like possible deaths like Father Ater reversible, and any of the Fey Knights who would die. It also takes away worries in things like the main quest, or just the world as a whole. I suppose the implication could be that the Resurrecting Potion only works on Fey because we're the first ever mortal resurrected? I suppose so, but still, I don't like it. Anyways, let's continue on. As we go through the forest and through tunnels, fighting boggarts, the maid stops us again, just before we enter fully, saying that, just like the tales, we must do her challenge. The Wall of Thorns, and that a knight needs armor. She still calls us beloved and says that she wants the one thing immortality cannot provide. Love. And that we can rescue our friends. But I wouldn't I wouldn't call them friends, but fair enough. We continue on and meet Sir Aramir and Kreth dueling each other for the right to be the maid's champion. They've already killed her other champion and you need their armor. If you have high enough to spell, you can dispel the curse on them and be given the armor. If not, you must kill one of them and continue on. This doesn't change much. My first playthrough, before I recorded, I killed them. And here I spared them. You get a handful of extra lines of dialogue, of them being confused and angry. And they show up at the House of Ballads later, briefly. Either way, the maid speaks once more, telling us that we must cross the gorge. But the only way it will race is to kill her champion, who's already dead. We go below and find him and the corpses of his previous incarnations below. I find this visual pretty striking. The Fae, who seem to care so much for ceremony, just leave a former knight of their house's body just in the water to rot. We resurrect him, kill him again, and go up to cross the gorge. It is a kind of funny encounter, though. Him still being the moment of his death and just casually taking the news. I mean, I suppose whenever you're a Fae and you die over and over again, you get used to it, the poor bastard. And... I guess it isn't the end for him. Perhaps, sadly enough, since we'll have to go through this again and again. When we go above, we meet the knight that we didn't free or kill earlier. Sir Kreth, for me. We can choose to free or kill again, and again, we'll choose to free. 
He seems almost upset that the maid has broken her role, claiming that before he almost saw her as an equal, an actor in the same play. But now she's acting out, she's become a true villain, no longer just fulfilling her role, stepping out of it. You continue into Windermere, finding a place named Summer's End, a town that the maid has built into the valley filled with fey monsters who actually aren't hostile to you, giving you one of the few chances in the game to look at monster designs up close. The maid tempts you into joining her. You are brave. No mortal has ever set foot in my domain. Isn't it wondrous? I've spent centuries whispering my wishes to the earth, the trees. The crystal has made it so. Never before has there been one worthy of sharing it with me. Do you fancy yourself a ruler? Join me and my enchanted beasts in this, the autumn of my kind. And you only get three very strange options. One being a tyrant, one saying you'll rule alone, and the third saying that you're going to murder her before that can happen. None of these felt right for me or my character, so I chose the tyrant one, imagining it as sarcastic in my head. But she agrees, says the crystal will finally allow her to make chains, and she will march on the house, destroying it, writing the ending for herself finally, freeing her and everyone else within its chains. She, however, does not allow you into the castle proper, where Winston and the rest of the court is saying, if it's your fate, you'll come in and claim it. Continuing into the currently peaceful valley, we find interestingly enough the original Sir Sagril, who has become chancellor to the maid. He claims that she's actually a hero in the songs of the Winter Fay, but her favorite role here in the Court of Summer is that of the tyrant. But the truth is somewhere in the middle. He advises us to find the Prismere crystals and destroy them. Doing so will make the other Fey hostile, but could gain us entry into the castle. I am a bit confused on Sagril here. I do like his presence here quite a bit. I think he's meant to be the original Sagril. I also think that he may be the original Sagril's soul reborn into a new body, as he claims he only recently came of age. So soul-wise, he is the same person, but inhabiting a new body. Fey in the setting are super strange, but also super interesting. He claims the crystal can only be seen by her song, so we use the whistle that Brother Wolf gave us earlier to find them. We learn through the nearby lore stones that this too happens in the tales, though in those it is Queen Bellmaid who infiltrates the castle, and it is her who smashes the crystals. At the very end of these lore stones, the narrator summarizes the story as women's true strength being in the failings of men. I bring this up due to something that will happen soon, I think calling back to this lore stone. This has all happened before, and like fate is ordained, we do it again, though not as Bellmaid, instead as Sagril, or more honestly, as the Fateless One. We smash the crystals, kill the Fey army, and ring the bell tower, opening the castle, and freeing the real Sagril, though he seemed to be under no enchantment. The gate is now open for him to leave. He tells us that the maid is not a bad sort, that she seems particularly fascinated with us, even calling us beautiful to him in private, and that, well, she isn't all bad, as long as we can handle her Machiavellian scheming. But these crystals have driven her crazy. Either way, he bids us farewell and leaves. To be honest, he's been the only decent fey in this entire quest. We enter the castle after dispatching of her crystals and fey army, and she appears again. Speaking of the castle as a prison, with a determined promise that she will escape it. She talks of her freeing the knights, who she has now enchanted. Ironically enough, though, robbing them of their own free will. I do find this tragic. In her own hope of freeing herself from fate, she took away others' freedom, with a forced idea upon them of them being free from the cycle. I suppose that is her revenge. She was expected to do a role, and now she's forcing others to do a role that she wishes. And what she has chosen is a faux freedom. She invites us to join her again, offering her love once more and leaves. And I do want to finally comment on this and say that this is not something I like about the quest. I think the romance part of this should have been optional if not completely taken out. It gives the whole quest and decision a false edge to it. I understand that in the lore she is a romantic wanting King Winston, but if this was going to be a thing, it should have been developed more. I said near the beginning of the video that I would have traded dozens of the other boring quests in this game, but there's a few more faction quests. I think here there definitely should have been more. 
Give us more chances to meet the maid. Give us more time to be a part of the court of enchantments. Get used to the people within it, their roles and stories, and your own role as Sir Sagrel within them. Maybe have her approach you, like she did the other applicants, asking you to spy. They won't have to change too much. There's an optional check-in with her at the end of quests, with the option of being a double agent, betraying her to the House of Ballads. Give us two, three, maybe five more quests. Let this love thing be optional, if you flirt first or she flirts first and you reciprocate. But as it is now, it just feels half-baked. And if you do romance her, it does absolutely nothing. This gives a bad taste in my mouth, like bad fan service, or like her manipulating the player. Honestly, I think it's just more so the stench of an underdone quest line, which I think is the most accurate. As sadly, even though I like Kingdoms of Amalur, a lot of it does feel unfinished, and I think it is admittedly so. Either way, let's continue. We meet Ferrari, same business, for your kill him, and later on we meet King Winston, who is just absolutely cowardly. Like the others, he's even bound by the crystal. I assume he just came along out of fear, saying if he follows us for a bit, maybe he'll gain his courage. The two remaining knights of the court are ensnared. Bellmaid speaks about no longer wanting to be under the shackles of a man who's in every way her inferior, which I mean, honestly, yeah. Winston is a loser. His one great deed we know of is stabbing someone who he tricked in the back, murdering her. Bellmaid is the one that she snuck into the castle fought monsters and broke magical mind-controlling crystals. I think this may be an actual belief of Bellmaid's. I mean, even her lore stone just denotes her as a part of Winston, saying basically, oh, she makes up for his shortcomings. She isn't an equal to him or anything, just a useful side plot to our great man. Certainly, I believe the maid believes this of Bellmaid and Winston. We free Bellmaid and Elaine. And Bellmaid seems insulted at the concept of the new house of ballads being built on losses and trying to change. Likewise, Elaine thinks only victories in the past matter. They are people of victory, not lost. It cannot change, is not the way. Ugh. Speaking to Winston as we approach the maid's final chamber, he mocks the maid, almost rejoicing that we're going to the final place where she's fated to die. Where in the tale, he stabs her in the back after lying to her about his love. He chuckles and says that it's her favorite place because she can see the stars. She can see the freedom of space, the stars above, and he even laughs at this, like it's funny. He has killed her so many times, he knows her favorite thing about her death room. If that's not the darkest shit ever, I don't know what to tell you. It gave me shivers the first time I got the dialogue. The animation of him chuckling while saying it, it's, it's disgusting. Speaking of disgusting... As he reached the barrier just outside of her room, he says he can't go any further. Every other time before this, he'd been a puppet on the string, assured to win. But now that's unsure what the outcome is, he's scared. He runs away like the true coward he is, giving us the king's totem. He says he believes in us while running away, which is actually very funny. We enter and fight the maid. Her ending decided countless times before she at least has to try and fight now. It's a difficult fight, especially if you're low on potions. When we lower her health, she begs for her life. Don't do this. I beg you. I seek only justice for what has been done to me all these many lifetimes. Don't I deserve as much? Don't we all? When I had to finally decide on what to do with her and continue my playthrough, I ultimately decided to spare her. No longer are you at war with me for reasons you do not understand. You have seen the world as I have, as a realm of limitless potential. We usher in a new season, you and I. One where we rule the House of Ballads side by side. The Maid of Windermere is finished playing the villain. Now go. I shall prepare a place for you. Our telling is whatever we wish to make it. I went back and forth to see the results. And in both ways you condemn her to death feels so wrong. It makes me feel like the villain. A heretic hunting inquisitor of fate. 
burning and killing those who dare step out of line and wish to escape it. Did she overstep? Oh, certainly. When you have hundreds, thousands of years of pain, the same cycle of losing, being betrayed, and being literally stabbed in the back and murdered, killing all these people even once honestly doesn't seem like enough to tip the scales majorly in terms of revenge. The Fae are immortal. In this playthrough, she didn't even kill anyone. She took away people's minds and autonomy, yes, and caused the death of one innocent human. But when weighed against the crimes of the House of Ballads, it's, as much as I hate to say it, not even close. The members of the House of Ballads are all frauds. Immortal children playing a game of knights and monsters, and they always get to be on the side of knights and never give a chance for the monsters to explain themselves. Even if she had approached them and explained that she didn't want to continue, do you think that they would let her stop? No. They would insist that she play her role, send the Thresh and Troll out to make her kidnap all those people, also that they can storm her castle and play make-believe. She's entirely justified in killing these people. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is certainly outdated, but when it's all of your eyes and teeth, taking one eye and two teeth from the perpetrator seems like they're getting the easy way out. Honestly, if I was her, I'd burn the whole damn House of Ballads down. Screw ruling over it, get rid of it, and its dogmatic ideas. The House of Ballads is so powerful, they have actual resurrection potions. Do you think they used it once on an enemy? Or one who was not their own? Absolutely not. They could do their whole story and then revive her and ask her if she'd want a chance of escaping it, but they didn't. They can't comprehend it. They themselves are prisoners within fate. They believe it's completely unconquerable. Struggling against it is meaningless. Even when they have evidence fate is now no longer a law of this world, they still continue on, denying the changing times. A system broken. The law is corrupt and bad. They don't care. It has always been this way, so it must stay this way. Is the opposite of what we say in our world. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The Fae only want to repeat history. I do think that sparing her is the intended ending as well. When you finish the quest line either way, you get awarded the Twist of Fate Iconoclast. Literally, a person who destroys or changes previously held beliefs and institutions. No matter your ending, the House of Balance is forever changed. King Winston is proved a useless coward. Every knight is proved valuable, and the villains are proved capable of pushing back. For that matter, we are the fateless one. Our very presence is meant to shake up the foundation of the world and its beliefs. I think to further support this, what's better? The same rulers? The same knights? The same ideas? In this changed world where fate no longer holds any sway? Still working off an idea of a world that is no longer true? Repeating things for eternity just because fate deemed it so once? No, Hallam the White and the same ideals of these knights have no place anymore. From this quest on, I made my personal canon fateless one an iconoclast. He and I believed there needs to be change. From this quest on, I played him as such. Traditionalist views that kept people rooted to inequality, poorer living, and outdated ideals need to be uprooted. And the Maid of Windermere, freed from Prismere crystals, was the way to change the Fae here in the House of Ballads. Living proof that the cycle holds no power anymore. The wheel that was turning is now broken. The cogs controlling it need to be replaced. Though the game treated it like we were lovers, there was no real dialogue to reflect this. And as such, I played the game like it wasn't the case. In my own headcanon, there is no mention of us being lovers. No. He simply spared her because he figured it was the right thing to do. I returned to the House of Ballads maybe two or three more times my playthrough after this moment. And the house was hers. Hallam and the others remained for now, save Winston. She hadn't pushed her vengeance any further. Her point was made and she was free. And so were all the others. She now had the power to name the new important stories. New important people. And hopefully actual people. Not just repeats of the same person over and over. Maybe we could see Nyx there, living free and happily. Bloody Bones restored to his actual name, Fomor, who, by the way, was once a knight of the House of Ballads. His sentence of punishment served. Maybe other mortals could join too. Their stories remembered as they should be. The tragic tale of Father Ateran, Brother Wolf remembered. 
though they could not act them out for eternity, they still happened. And they still mattered. Hell, we proved that by our actions in the quest line. The fey ideology completely broken. Their racist beliefs of mortals being inferior and unable to change was just immediately challenged and proven wrong. This quest in this whole game reminds me a bit of Gnostic ideas. The idea of people being trapped on this earth like it's a prison, kept in cycles of painful life, unable to escape. And honestly, it was very freeing and very inspiring to play a story for me and let one person escape it, at least for now. Maybe she will die again, her rule short and forgotten. But for at least a moment, she wasn't the scared, betrayed woman lying in the courtyard, bleeding out while grasping for a look at the infinite and free stars above, imagining her freedom. For just a moment, she wasn't just reaching for them. No, instead she was among them. The Maid of Windermere was free. No. Her name isn't the Maid of Windermere. It's Magware. And, for now, she is the leader of the House of Balance.